Turn to your neighbor and say, you're looking good today. You're looking good today. <laughs> uh, okay, well, find something that you think looks good, even if it's their buttons. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so um, how many of you uh, missed the message last Sunday? How many of you were not here? Because I'm building on, on the message. Okay, there are a few of you. I want to encourage you, if you weren't here last week, uh, to try and catch up. I'll be building on what I shared last week. And um, I'm talking about um, teaching us on finding strength in God, finding strength in God. And specifically last week, I was looking at the life of David and drawing a lot of lessons from the life of David. And that's where I'm going to be continuing this week. Um, and I think in terms of a recap, I'm not going to re-preach the message. So if you missed it, you have to be present to when I encourage you to go listen to it. But in terms of a recap, I want to say that when I look at the life of David, there's so many lessons that I learn from him, especially how he responded to certain situations. And we were looking last week and, and we, we noticed that a lot of uh, the tools that God used to fashion David are not the tools that we would choose in our own lives um, in terms of preparation for ministry, in terms of preparation for destiny. And God used betrayal and rejection um, over and over again, betrayal, rejection, false accusation in David's life to prepare him to be a king. So if you have a destiny, which we all do, and if God has called you and he's called all of us, if there's something great that is on your life, be encouraged when you face betrayal, when you face rejection, when you face false accusation, don't be surprised by it. Because if you respond right, God is going to move you on to fulfill your destiny, your destiny and your calling. And that was kind of like a, that's a summary of what we looked at last week. We have to respond right. We have to have a right heart attitude in our times of difficulty in order to find strength in God. And in order to strengthen our hearts in God, we can't pick up offense. We can't pick up bitterness. We can't carry anger toward God toward other people when these things happen to us but we have to keep our hearts in the right space and then in that uh, with our hearts in the right space then we can start to use some of these tools I'm going to look at today and actually find strength in God so last week we spoke a lot about keeping our hearts the Bible said that says that um, we have to keep our hearts because from it flow a lot of the issues of life Okay, we have to keep our hearts, make sure we're continually pulling out those weeds in the gardens of our heart, pulling out those things that trip us up. And as we're walking and our hearts are right, then we can begin to learn, uh, do, uh, apply some of the lessons that I'm going to look at today from the life of David in terms of practical things that we can do like pray, praise, thanksgiving, all of these types of things, which are practical tools. Um, but I'm wanting to, specifically today, I'm wanting to speak to people who are in that season of hiddenness. And many of us are in those seasons of hiddenness in one, at one time or another in our lives. Maybe in one area of your life, you're walking in the promise of God and in a season of manifestation. But maybe in another area, it's a season of hiddenness. Or maybe you might say to me, you know what, I'm walking in the fullness of what I'm supposed to be walking in this season. Uh, but even if you are in that space, at some time or another, you're going to be in a place of hiddenness you're going to be in a place of testing and you're going to need these things that I'm talking about today and so if you remember last week I said to you that when God spoke to David and and sent prophet Samuel the prophet Samuel to call him out where was he he was with the sheep he was with the goats he was in the bush he was in a place of hiddenness and that's where God pulled him out and said to him I'm going to make you king and the prophet spoke the word word over him and then the next day was he king no so why are we surprised when God speaks a word over us today and tomorrow we're not walking in it we don't see that pattern in the Bible. We see God sent a prophet. The prophet spoke the word over David's life. The next day, where was David? He was back in the wilderness with the sheep and the goats. And he was still back in the wilderness fighting lions and bear where, bears where no one could see him in the wilderness in hiddenness. And he had to work out and be faithful in that place of hiddenness waiting for the fulfillment of the word that God declared over him. See, sometimes God declares a word over us and then we're in the wilderness, we're in a season of hiddenness and we get frustrated because we don't feel according to our timing that it's moving quite fast enough. Lord, have you forgotten what you spoke over me? Lord, was it really you? 
true? Did you speak that over me? Lord, why are these people doing this to me? I should be there. I should be doing that. Well, you know what? We have to be faithful with where we at, with what God has put in our hand and watch over our hearts and know that he's actually training us and preparing us and trust him in that space. Amen. Okay, so in our time of hiddenness, in our time of wilderness, in our time where God is preparing us for that manifestation, we have to know God is teaching us, God is training us, God is preparing us. Let's make sure we learn the lessons that he wants to teach us the first time, because God is, we don't always get to fail with God, we just get to go round the hill again. I don't want to go round and round the same mountain seven times and it prolongs my preparation period by seven times the length because I don't get the message, okay? The Bible says that he who heeds the rebukes of life will abide among the wise. And Psalm 144 verse 1 to 2 says, Blessed be the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle, my loving kindness and my fortress my high tower and my deliverer, my shield and the one in whom I take refuge, who subdues people under me. Blessed be the Lord my rock who tra trains my hands for war. God loves to teach us how to war. Where did he teach da uh, David how to slay Goliaths? In the wilderness. Remember what David said? Sorry, Sipo, there's, ring, there's a ring on this. There's, there's feedback or something, I think. Where did God teach David how to fight and slay Goliath? He taught him in the wilderness where no one was watching. When it didn't really matter if he killed the lion or the bear or not. When no one would know. That's where God taught him. God teaches our hands for and trains us for our destiny in the places of hiddenness where no one else is looking. God trains our hands for. He trains our fingers for battle. In Deuteronomy 8 verse 11 to 17, um, the, the, the Israelites are getting instructions. And um, the Lord says to them, beware that you don't forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments. Lest when you're eaten and are full and have beautiful houses and dwell in them, when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold are multiplied and so on and so forth. Basically, when you're in your season of manifestation and things are looking good, beware that you don't forget the Lord your God. Remember that it is he who led you through the wilderness, through your place of hiddenness. Remember that it was him in which there were fiery serpents and scorpions, a thirsty land where there was no water, that he might humble you and he test you to do good to you in the end. Why does he humble us and test us? That he might humble you and test you to do good to you in the end. Why did he humble and test the Israelites? So that he could do good to them in the end. In our place of wilderness, in our place of testing, in our place of hiddenness, we always have to remember this, that God is doing it in order to do good to us in the end. We have to trust him. God is good. He has, he has my best interests at heart. You know, I prayed, I remember praying a prayer when I was a young Christian and I still stand by that and I'm like, yes, Lord. I said, Lord, please don't ever let my gifting surpass my character. Please don't ever let my gifting surpass my character. And maybe when things take long in my life, maybe it's because my character hasn't caught up to my gifting. And God is saying, you know what? There's a, there's a big gifting on your life. I know he's put a big gifting on my life. I know that. And I'm saying, Lord, I've seen so many people when they get to that place of having influence, when they get to that place of having a platform and they fall because their character couldn't sustain the gift. And I don't want to be in that place. And I want to make sure that I, that I keep my heart in a place of hiding, in a place of wilderness, knowing that God knows what's in my heart. God knows my weaknesses. God knows where he's called me and God knows what he needs to put in me that I can stand in that place that he's called me to. Amen. And he leads us through the wilderness that he might humble us, Deuteronomy 8 says, that he might test us to do good to us in the end. So when we're in that place where David was, in that place of wilderness, we're taking care of the sheep. There's no one else around us. No one sees what we're doing. We're trying to just be faithful with, with what's in our hand. But it's not what we call to ultimately. It doesn't really bring fulfillment in, my, in our hearts because ultimately we know there's more. There's something else that God has called me to. There's something else that he declared over my life. But let me be faithful with this because it's in this place that God is going to make sure that one day when I stand there, that thing that he's called me to I'm not going to fall amen 
So at times in our place of hiddenness, we can become discouraged. Come on, how many of you ever felt discouraged because it's taking so long? Okay, I see one hand, one hand at the back. <laughs> okay, we can become discouraged. We can wonder why. We don't understand why. But at that point, we need to know and to trust our Father. Exodus 23, verse tw uh, Exodus 23 says, um, the Lord is speaking and he says to the Israelites, says, I will send my terror ahead of you and create panic among all the people whose lands you invade. I will make all your enemies turn and run. Wow. I will send terror ahead of you to drive out all the ites, Hivites, Canaanites, Hittites, etc. But listen to this. He says, but I will not drive them out in a single year because the land would become desolate and the wild animals would multiply and threaten you. I will drive them out a little at a time until your population has, don't worry, don't worry, it's okay. There's someone looking after Okay, I will drive them out a little bit at a time until your population has increased enough to take possession of the land. You see, in our minds, we're like, God, give it to me now. Chase them out now. This is my land. We want it. We can take, take it. And the Lord is saying, no, actually, let me drive them out a little bit. Because otherwise, you won't increase enough. Otherwise, you won't be able to stand and keep that which I've given you. See, God wants us to take possession of our land and to stand in our place of destiny and be able to be broad enough and big enough and have hearts big enough, have characters big enough to be able to stand and hold it and keep it. The enemy can't come and take back what the Lord has given us. Amen. It says, I will drive out your enemies a little bit at a time until you've increased enough to take possession of the land. See, God knows. God is wise. His foolishness is wiser than our wisest. Amen. We have to trust him. I love John 15. It says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he leaves. No. Does it say that? No. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. He prunes. Are you bearing fruit? Maybe, maybe not. But guess what? He's going to prune you. If you're bearing fruit, he's going to prune. If you're not bearing fruit, he's going to prune. Or he's going to throw you away. But I don't think he'll throw you away. Okay. <laughs> okay. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. Why? That it may bear more fruit. So if he's pruning you, that's okay. Be pruned. There's seasons. Allow him to prune you. Because he's going to bring forth more fruit. John 15 verse 5, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. God is the one who brings forth fruit. If we remain connected to him, if he's pruning, that's okay. If we're in a season of hiddenness, that's okay. We've got to continue to trust him, people. Amen. We need to understand the times and the seasons. There are times and seasons with God. Not everything is, is, is at 100 and 20 Ks an hour from start to finish. It doesn't work like that. There are rhythms in the spirit. There are rhythms in life. There are seasons. Come on, ladies. We know that. There are seasons to on-ramp in your career. There are seasons to off-ramp, to get married, to have kids. There are seasons to on-ramp again. There are different seasons in life. And we have to flow with the seasons. We can't fight against them. Amen. Okay. Seasons of hiddenness. Seasons of preparation. Those are about our hearts. God is doing something deep in our hearts. He's up to something with regards to our hearts. We can't be looking for fruit and manifestation on the outside when God is doing something deep in our hearts. We've got to say, okay, let me submit to the season. Lord, let's deal with my heart. Let's deal with my response to certain things. Let's deal with my daily disciplines. Let's deal with what I do when I don't feel like it. What do I do when I don't feel like praying? What do I do when I can't feel your presence? What what do I do when everything is falling, up, falling down around me? Nothing seems to be succeeding and I don't feel like praising. What do I do then, Lord? Well, that's a season where he's, he's teaching you about your spiritual disciplines. He's teaching you to do the right thing even if you don't feel like it. Amen. And that is really important. It's important that we learn how to discipline ourselves to respond in accordance of the word of God, whether we feel like it or whether we don't. That is a really hard place. That is a really hard place. You know, I don't know how many of you are aware, but I cycle in the cradle on the weekends on Saturdays. Yesterday, I couldn't go for two reasons. One, there was a shooting last weekend. A guy was shot. He was cycling on, on his own on Saturday morning. I didn't really want to go. 
okay? But, but second of all, my kids had soccer. I had to take my kids to soccer. I couldn't go cycling on the road. I had to sit on my bicycle trainer. I've got a competition coming up in two weeks, so I didn't have a choice. I had to sit on my indoor trainer for three hours yesterday. Do you know how torturous that is? I just want to say that. That is like torture. But you know what? That is what I had to do it. I had to do it. I have no choice. And that is how we have to be with spiritual discipline. It's just discipline. You don't feel like doing it. I don't feel like getting up. I don't feel like giving thanks. I don't feel like remembering what God did. I don't feel like praising. I don't feel like going to church. I don't feel like going to cell group. I don't feel like, but you know what? That is what discipline is about. It's not about what we feel like doing. It's about doing the right thing because we know to get where we want to go, we've got to do it. Amen. To get where we've got to go, we've got to do it. And we've got to do it now when we don't feel like doing it. Because maybe one day when we're there, we're not going to feel like doing it. And if we haven't learned the lesson, by the time we get there, we're going to be in big trouble. Amen. Okay. So these are some of the spiritual disciplines that I learned from the life of David. And we're gonna, I'm just going to look at two today. I'm going to look at two, and these are really important, and they're really simple. And you might say to me, oh, but I already know that. Well, guess what? I can know that I need to wake up and pray, but it doesn't mean I do it. Amen. And so as I go through these various points this morning, I'm wanting you to not look at your neighbor on your right, to not think about your husband or your wife, to not think about, to not apply it to your boss or to your kids or to anybody else. I want you to introspect and say, Lord, this is the measure that you're setting before me today. How do I measure up with this? Can you do that? Can, can we make a deal? I've got about, I can see about four or five heads. Can we make a deal? You'll look at yourself this morning. Okay. I've got about 10 heads. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the first discipline, the first thing that we've got to learn in our season of hiddenness is prayer. Is prayer. We have to pray. Most of us, we love to rush out and do our lists, our to-do lists. And we, we've got so much to do. We're so busy that we think we're too busy to pray. But we're too busy to not pray. We're too busy to not pray. I've noticed in my life when I've got so many things to do, if I start with prayer, if I start with prayer, the rest of the stuff, it falls into place much more quickly. I hit less speed bumps along the way, okay? I don't like speed bumps, okay? I hit less speed bumps and um, things flow more readily. I bump into the right people when I'm supposed to speak to someone. I don't have to call and wait. I don't have to call back. There are less problems along the way because he goes before me. So we need to learn to pray. Now, if I look at the life of David, the first type of prayer that I'm wanting to point us to is number one, inquiring of God inquiring of God. We've got to learn to inquire of God. How many of us rush ahead to do something and then we ask God to put his blessing on what we already decided we're going to do? A lot of us do that. But David, I don't see that in David. So many instances, and some of them we looked at last week, David inquired of God before he did anything. Lord, should I do this or should I not? That's why he had success. And the example that I'm wanting to bring before you this morning is 1 Samuel 30, verse 6 to 10. David was now in great danger. Do you remember this example from last week? David was in great danger. Remember, he, um, he was being chased by Saul. Then the Philistines didn't want to fight with him. Then he went back to Ziklag, his home, and then he discovered that all his, his family, his home, his family had been kidnapped by the Amalekites. His home had been burnt. He'd lost everything. He sat down with these men that he's lived with, walked with, fought with, uh, slept with, um, laughed with, done life with. He sat down with these men who've lost their families and he, they cried until they were exhausted. They wept. The Bible says they wept until they were exhausted. And then this is where we find the scripture. David was in great danger because these men, his men, wanted to stone him his men wanted to stone him because they'd lost all their sons and daughters. And that's where it says, but David found strength in the Lord his God. So in the middle of the betrayal, in the middle of the difficult situation, in the middle of the space where he's emotionally spent, where he's spiritually challenged, where he's physically spent, he found strength in God. And that was because he'd learned to do it in the place of hiddenness. Amen. But then it says, 
David asked the Lord, should I chase after this band of raiders? Will I catch them? And the Lord said, yes, go after them. You will recover everything taken from you. So David inquired of the Lord. He asked God, even though he was tired, I'm pretty sure he didn't feel like chasing after a band of raiders. The Bible says he was exhausted. So David and his 600 men set out and then 200 of his men were too exhausted to cross the brook. So David continued with 400 men. So in David's darkest hour, he inquired of the Lord. He waited around to hear the answer. Some of us don't wait long enough. We're too impatient to hear the answer. Okay. And then he obeyed God in spite of being tired, in spite of reduced men, and in spite of discouragement, he obeyed God. And this was what set David apart from Saul, because in 1 Chronicles 10 verse 13, we're told, So Saul died because he was unfaithful to the Lord. He failed to obey the Lord's command, and he even consulted a medium instead of asking the Lord for guidance. So the Lord killed him and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. A nice little comparison there for us. David inquired of the Lord and obeyed the Lord. Saul inquired of a medium and did not obey the Lord. Therefore, the Lord took Saul's destiny, Saul's kingdom from Saul and all his descendants and gave it to David and Saul died. That's a lesson for us. No, 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 I'll just sin because you see, I can sin and then God will forgive me tomorrow. No, 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 I'll just sleep with my boyfriend because God will forgive me tomorrow. Um, actually, honey, if I look in the Bible, he can forgive you, but he will, he, there'll be consequences. There are always consequences. There are always consequences. He will forgive you. Your relationship can be restored, but there will be consequences. There will be consequences for your destiny, for your calling, and maybe for your, inher in, for your descendants as well. There are always consequences. So we see that David inquired of the Lord, and he determined in his heart that he was going to obey the Lord regardless of what the Lord said, even if he didn't feel like doing it. Where did he learn that? He learned that in a place of hiddenness. So some of you might say to me, well, that's fine. I, I inquire of the Lord, but I can't hear him answering me. How many of you will say that? I inquire of the Lord. Lord, should I do this or this? And I wait, but I don't know how to hear or I can't hear what he's saying. Or I still don't know what's the right thing to do. But you know what? You keep praying. You keep asking. You keep knocking. That's what Jesus said. He said, keep praying, keep asking, keep knocking, and the door will open. Keep saying, Lord, I commit my life to you. Lord, I consecrate my life to you. Lord, would you speak to me? Lord, would you show me the right door to, to walk through? Lord, would you close the doors that are not of you? And will you open the doors that are of you? Lord, would you speak to me? Lord, would you place people around me that will give me counsel then you speak to people around you that you trust not people who will tickle their, your ears with what you want to hear but people who will tell you the truth like your husband speak to them say what do you think what what this or this this is where I'm wanting to go what what is your counsel dig into the word of God what are the principles in the word of God because God sometimes doesn't need to give us an audible answer in our in our ears or in our hearts because his answer is in our in, is, is, is in his word amen they're principles that we build our lives on he's not going to give you an answer that contradicts what is in his word so we keep knocking we keep seeking we keep trying to find out and God will answer us amen as I was preparing this, I was thinking of our golden retriever. We have, this, we have a golden retriever, and he is the picture of persistence to me <laughs> because we put the dogs out at night, and we close the door, <laughs> and it's like he barks and 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 barks, and, barks and, barks. <laughs> and he doesn't stop barking until you go out or you let him in. And I was just thinking, sure, I could learn a lesson or two about persistence from my dog. He barks and barks and scratches and barks and barks and barks and barks until we open the door, you know? And that's what we need to be like with God. So the first thing in prayer is we've got to inquire. We've got to remember to inquire of the Lord. Okay, the second thing is pour out your heart before God. Cry out to Him for help. Do you remember last weekend we looked at... Um, that situation where David is now married to Michal and Saul sends messengers to David's house to watch him and to kill him in the morning. And Michal, his wife, who, by the way, is Saul's daughter, has to let David down through a window in the night so that she can save his life. And that is, that is betrayal. Okay, we looked at that last week and, and David's response and all of this. But if you look at Psalm 59, it's, 
It's a response of David to this particular situation where he's been betrayed, he's being hunted by his own king who he's done nothing wrong to. And he's crying. What is he doing? He's pouring out his heart before God and crying out to God. Psalm 59. For the choir director, a psalm of David regarding the time Saul sent soldiers to watch David's house in order to kill him. This is David. He says, Lord, rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who have come to destroy me. Rescue me from criminals. They have set an ambush for me. Fierce enemies are out there waiting, Lord. Though I have not sinned or offend them, I've offended them. I've done nothing wrong, yet they're attacking me. Lord, wake up and see what's happening. Lord, God of heaven's armies, wake up. Show no mercy to them. They come out at night snarling like vicious dogs, etc., etc. And he carries on. What is he doing? He's pouring out his heart before the Lord. He's crying out that God would save him. He's, his heart is still straightened toward God, even in this time of intense persecution. His heart, his heart is still trusting in God. Psalm 62 verse 8 says, O oh my people, trust in the Lord at all times. Pour out your heart to him, for God is our refuge. So you might say to me, but why do I need to pour out my heart to God? He already knows and understands. Yes, he already knows and understands. But for your benefits, you need to pour out your heart to him. Amen. You need to pour out your heart to him. You need to express everything that's going on inside of you. When we bottle everything up, we end up at a certain point exploding. Okay, we need to pour out our hearts towards God. The third thing, the third type of prayer that I'm wanting to encourage us to do today is to make declarations. Continuing in Psalm 59, this is the same Psalm. This is David. This is what he says, Lord, you are my strength. I wait for you to rescue me for you, O God, are my fortress. In his unfailing love, my, love, my God will stand with me. He will let me look down and triumph on all my enemies. But as for me, I will sing of your power. Each morning I will sing with joy about your unfailing love. For you have been my refuge, my place of safety. When I am in distress, oh my strength, to you I will sing praises. God, you are my refuge, the God who shows me unfailing love. Somewhere in the middle of all this betrayal and this um, fiery trial that David is in, he still can see the unfailing love of the Lord. That is amazing. He's still singing of the unfailing love. He's making declarations about God being his fortress and his refuge. And as he does that, it's powerful. He's agreeing with the word of God. Psalm 144, I read it to you at the beginning of my message. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle. He is my loving kindness, my fortress, my high tower, my deliverer, my shield, the one in whom I take refuge. Isn't that powerful? Sometimes we've got to stand still in our time of difficulty and just say, Lord, you are my refuge. You are my strength. I look to you for help. You are my high tower. You, you are my everything, Lord God. Still the mouths, the tongues of every tongue that is rising against me, Lord God. We're looking to him. We're saying, you're the one who protects me. Whatever these people are saying, you're the one. Psalm 18, I love this, verse 2 to 3. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength, and whom I trust, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who's worthy to be praised, and so shall I be saved from my enemies. What is all of this? These are declarations. We need to come back to a place in our own personal prayer time where we utilize these tools. These are what David used. We've got to make declarations. Who is God? God is a mighty warrior. God is the beginning and the end. God is the Alpha and the Omega. God goes before us and he is our rear God. He is our refuge. He is our strength. God works all things out for my benefit. We've got to stand and declare. In that place of standing and declaring, our faith wells up. I can feel it now even as I'm just reading this word, as I'm reciting this to you. Faith begins to build in our hearts. Amen. We're stronger in the spirit when we do this. I love Psalm 121. I will lift my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. It's, it's Pastor Vim's favorite psalm, I think. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow my foot to be moved. Amen. He neither slumbers nor sleeps. He keeps me as the shade at my right hand. He will preserve me from all evil. He'll preserve my soul, my going out, my coming in. Powerful. Powerful. Which brings me to my next one. We've got to pray the word. People, we've got to pray the word. The word is powerful. An example of this from David is in Psalm 103, verse 7 to 9, he says, He made known 
his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. What is David quoting? David is quoting from Exodus. Do you remember when Moses goes up uh, Mount Sinai and asks the Lord to show, to show himself to him and and the Lord passes him and says, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, etc., etc. That, that, that is what David is remembering. That is what David is thinking of. That is what David is declaring. When I ask you today, what word are you declaring over your life? What word are you remembering? What word are you standing on today? We've got we to gotta stand on words. We've got to declare words. We've got to hide ourselves in the word of God. It's a place of safety. Jesus, even Jesus used the word of God. He declared it in his time of testing. When the enemy came to test him, he says, this is what the word of God says. That was the sword of the spirit. That was his offensive weapon. And we've got to remember as believers that the word of God is alive and powerful. It says in Hebrews, I've got it here. Hebrews 4 verse 12, the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and tenth intents of the heart. Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. The word we speak is powerful. God's word in our mouths is powerful. What word are you speaking over your life today? I've said this before that the Lord once said to me, you can have what you say, but you're saying what you have. See, that is a problem that most of us have. You can have what you say, but you say what you have. You're saying what you already have. And the Lord is saying, well, why don't you use my word to create something new in your life? But you're saying what you already have, what you see with your eyes. But see with the spirit and see by faith and declare what God is declaring over your life. Amen. I love the scripture in Isaiah 55. It says, for as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but shall accomplish what I please and prosper in the thing for which I sent it. What preceding word are you releasing from your mouth that God is releasing from his mouth? Because that word, the word that is proceeding from God's mouth, not a word that you've imagined, no. The word that God goes forth from God's mouth, that word is alive. That word will accomplish in the thing for which he sent it. So get, a li get in line with that word and declare it from your mouth because that word is alive. That word will not return to him void. That's the word that I want to release over my life because I know like I know, it doesn't matter how many years it takes, but one day I'm going to see the fulfillment of that word because God's word says that it does not return to him void. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. What word are you releasing from your mouth? What word are you releasing in prayer? I've got my, my Bible here, my, my favorite praying Bible. It's falling apart, but it's my favorite one because I know where everything is. How many of you have got Bibles like that? <laughs> you know where everything is. Whoops. And I want to give you some examples of declaring his word and praying his word. You know, sometimes when I don't feel like praying, yes, as a pastor, you sometimes don't feel like praying just like you, <laughs> okay? I turn to my favorite portions of scripture, which I've highlighted. And I want to encourage you to have these types of tools because we don't always feel like praying. We don't always feel like declaring his word, amen. And I come to this portion of Isaiah and I love Isaiah, I love Psalms. I love the apostolic prayers in the New Testament. And I'm gonna just, this, this is what I do. I, I'm wanting to equip you. You, you guys can, can do this with your favorite portions of Scripture. Father, I thank you. That I'm, reading, I'm starting in Isaiah 41. Father, I thank you that you have chosen me and have called me from the farthest regions of the world. And you say to me, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you and uphold you with my righteous right hand. Father, I thank you that in your word you say that all those who are incensed against me will be ashamed and disgraced and as nothing. That the enemies that strive with me, Lord God, that who war against me, they will be as nothing 
again because you hold my right hand and say to me, fear not, Trace, I am with you. Fear not, I am helping you. I am making you into a new threshing sledge with sharp teeth. You will thresh the mountains and beat them small and make the hills like chaff and winnow them and the wind shall carry them away. And you shall rejoice in the Lord and, the gl and glory in the Holy One of Israel. Lord, I thank you. That you say to me, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name, and you are mine. That when I pass through the waters, you say, I will be with you. And when I walk through the rivers, they will not overflow me, because you are with me. When I walk through the fire, I will not be burned, nor will the flame scorch me, because you, the Holy One of Israel, are with me and I am precious in your sight. Father, I thank you that you have said to me that you will pour your, descend, your, your spirit on my descendants, that you will put your blessing on my offspring, that they will spring up, Lord God, and they will call themselves by your name. I thank you for that, Lord God. I thank you, Father God, and I always pray this, as you know, that you go before me and you make the crooked places straight, that you break in pieces gates of bronze, that you cut bars of iron, that you give me hidden treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places, that I will know that you, the Lord, the God of Israel, call me by my name, and so on, and so on, and so on. There are so many scriptures. Father, I thank you that you are the Lord my God, who teaches me to profit, who leads me by the way that I should go. I thank you, Lord God, that you have called me from the womb, from the matrix of my mother. You have made mention of my name. You have made my mouth like a sharp sword in the shadow of your hand. You have hidden me. You have made me like a polished shaft and hidden me in your quiver. And you say to me today, you are my servant in whom I will be glorified. And on, I could go on and on and on. That is declaring the word of God. That is powerful, people. No, you know, sometimes when you come to pray, you immediately start thinking, okay, I need to pray for my husband. I need to pray for my kids. I need to pray for this, and I need to pray for finances. I need to pray for the church, and I need to pray for that person. And, oh, I'm seeing this person's face. And, oh, I need to. But you know what? We've got to pray for ourselves. I often forget we've got to pray for ourselves. Sometimes we don't feel like it. We've got to use the word of God. When we pray for ourselves, it's powerful. Amen. Look in Isaiah, look in Psalms. There's so many Psalms you can pray over yourself. Look in the New Testament, the apostolic prayers. Do you know what I mean by that? They're prayers at the beginning of the epistles. If you look through the epistles, maybe start around Ephesians. They're prayers that Paul writes in there that we need to pray over ourselves. Really, really powerful prayers. Like in Ephesians 1, verse 17, I pray, Lord God, that you would give to me the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you, that the eyes of my understanding would be enlightened, that I would know what is the hope of your calling and the riches of the glory of your inheritance and in the saints. And so on. In Ephesians 3, there's another one, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might in your in, in your inner man lord i pray that christ would dwell in my heart through faith that i would be rooted and grounded in love and so on and so on and so on if you look through the epistles especially the pauline epistles you'll see a lot of those types of prayers very powerful to pray of yourself declare the word pray the word over yourself it will not return to the lord void amen Amen. So what is the first thing that we've got to do, especially when we find ourselves in that season of hiddenness? Yes, I was going to say pray, but you're going to read it there. Okay, pray. Inquire of God. Yes, what else? Yes, what else? Yes, and what else? Amen. Amen. So if I could have a snippet into your prayer closet during the course of this week, I'm hoping that I'll see a lot of word coming out, that I'm going to see you guys praying the word a lot, declaring the word. I hope so. Amen. The second thing that we learn from David is praise and thanksgiving. So we've got to pray and we've also got to be found in a place of praise and thanksgiving. Now, the interesting thing with praise and thanksgiving is you have to actually have an understanding of who you're praising and giving thanks to. You have to have an understanding of what they've done, of who they are. You have to, it involves a bit of thought, amen. Okay, so we've got to, number one, remember who God is and meditate on this. We've got to spend a bit of time remembering who God is. Now, who God has revealed himself to me recently may not be who how and who he's revealing himself to you. He might be revealing himself to me in the little things of life that he's my provider. 
that he provides a cycling partner when I need a cycling partner on Saturdays in the cradle, that he provides someone to help me with this and this and this at home when I need it. But maybe for you, you don't need that. You need something else. You need to understand his love. So it's a very personal thing, and we need to remember who he is and who he's revealing himself to us in this season and meditate on that. Psalm 145, verse 4 to 7 says, One generation shall praise your works to another and declare your mighty acts. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty, on your wondrous works. Men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts and declare your greatness. They, they shall utter the memory of your great goodness and sing of your righteousness. Now, James 1 verse 17 says, Every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. Every good, every good and perfect gift. You might say to me, well, I don't really see who or how God is revealing himself to me in my life. I don't really see what he's doing. Well, that's okay. Let's just take a step back. Let's look at James. Every good and perfect gift. What is good in your life? What is good in your life? Do you have a good marriage? Do you have children? Do you have work? Do you have a, do you have a roof over your head? Do you have shoes on your feet? Do you have clothes on your back? Do you have food in your tummy? Or will you have food later on? Because the Bible says every good, every good and perfect gift comes down from who? Our Father. Every good. So if I take a step back and I say, okay, Lord, let me look at everything good in my life right now. Everything good. Everything good, Lord, comes from you. Let me start there. Let me start there because those things come from him, from the Father and of lights in whom there's no shadow of turning. So we've got to remember, think about who he is. And we've got to remember what he's done before and give thanks for this. You know, um, remembering the miracles that God has done is important. Remembrance is is important. David says in Psalm 77 verse 11 to 12, I will remember the works of the Lord. I will remember your wonders of old. I will meditate on your work and talk of your deeds. Remembrance is important because it gives us faith to go forward. When I remember what he did for me, when I moved 16 times and I didn't have an income and each time God provided for me, when I didn't have anywhere to go, every day at the last minute and the last hour he made a way, I'll know that okay you know what I find myself in this situation we don't know where we're going to go but it's okay because I've been there 16 times before and every time God came through so this time I know he'll come through I'm remembering we got to remember we can't forget the victories sometimes as Christians we pray and pray and pray we get the victory we don't even say thank you we're on to the next breakthrough trusting him for the next breakthrough we don't remember what he's done we don't stop to thank him Okay, so something about thanksgiving requires that we remember, and it's important that we remember. Okay, Psalm 105 verse 5 says, Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgment he uttered. Psalm 143 verse 5 to 6 says, I remember the days of old. I meditate on all you have done. I ponder the work of your hands. I stretch out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you. You see, sometimes we have to stop. We have to pause. Put aside our to-do prayer list. Okay, put aside the, the shopping list that we want to come to God with. Put aside all these things and say, Lord, you know what? I'm just going to spend this 20 minutes. I'm going to remember everything you have done for me and I'm going to meditate on what it looked like before and what happened and what you did and what it looked like after and I'm going to thank you for that and I'm just going to spend my prayer time doing that that is powerful it's not a waste of time that is incense before God and you know what it brings faith to our hearts there's a quote from Frederick, Frederick Beekner that I, I really love and I've, I've shared it with, with you before. And I'm going to share it again. It's, um, it's written so, so beautifully, so well. And he has a dream and I'm going to read it. He says, I dreamt that I was staying in a hot hotel room that I loved. I no longer have any clear picture of what the room looked like. And even in the dream itself, I think it wasn't so much the way, way the room looked that pleased me as it was the way it made me feel. It was a room where I felt happy, I felt at peace, where everything seemed the way it should be. And everything about myself seemed the way it should too. 
Then as the dream went on, I wandered on, I wandered off to other places, I did other things, and finally, after many adventures, I ended back at the same hotel. Only this time, I was given a different room. It didn't feel comfortable at all. It felt dark and cramped, and I felt very dark and cramped in it, so I made my way down to the man at the desk and told him my problem. And I said, on my earlier visit, I'd had this marvelous room. It was just right for me in every way, and I'd very much like if I could have that, please. The trouble, I explained, was I hadn't kept track of the room. I didn't even know how to ask for it or where it was. The clock was very understanding. He said he knew exactly the room I meant and I could have it any time. All I had to do, he said, was ask for it by name. So then, of course, I asked him what the name of the room was. And he said he'd be happy to tell me. He told me. The name of the room, he said, was Remember. Remember, he said. The name of the room I wanted was Remember. That was what woke me from my dream. It shocked me awake. It was a dream that seemed true not only for me, but true for everybody. And then he says this, listen, there is a deeper need, I think, not all the time, surely, but from time to time to enter that still room within us where the past lives on as part of the present. The name of that room is remember. The room where with patience, with clarity, with quietness of heart, we remember consciously to remember. What is he saying? He's saying sometimes we remember, we, didn't, we don't choose to remember, we just remember. But he's saying there's a time where we need to sit down and consciously remember things. Consciously bring to remembrance the things that God has done for us, the things that are good, the things that will bring us into that space of feeling faith again, feeling hope again, feeling trust in God, feeling like I can go on another day, another week, another year. Amen. Psalm 105, verse 1 to 5 says, Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Talk of his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face. Remember his works which he has done. His wonders and the judgments of his mouth. How many of us can say that in the past week, in the past month, we've sat down just to remember the things that God has done for us? Just to remember. No prayer list. No agenda, we're just going to remember and give thanks to God. It's a powerful, powerful discipline. With remembrance, we've got to give thanks. Remembrance and thanksgiving. To give thanks, we've got to remember. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is powerful. It brings us into the presence of the King. Psalm 100 verse 4. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Be thankful and bless his name. Thanksgiving ushers us into the presence of the King. Thanksgiving multiplies what is in our hand. Do you remember when Jesus performed that miracle with the seven loaves and the fish? And what does he do before everything multiplies and he feeds the thousands and thousands of men, women, and children? What does he do? He, he lifts up his hands and he gives thanks. He gave thanks and then he broke it and it multiplied. So giving thanks multiplies, can multiply what's in our hand. Giving thanks brings peace. Philippians 4 verse 6 to 7, it says, Be anxious for nothing but everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known and the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Giving thanks brings peace. Thanksgiving is powerful. When Jesus stands before the tomb that Lazarus has been holed up in for like however four days, three days or however many days, and it's probably, his body's probably beginning to, to stink. And he's standing there and Lazarus is dead. What does he do? He says, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me. Then Jesus says, Lazarus, come out. So thanksgiving can bring forth life. Thanksgiving is a key in bringing forth life out of dead situations. Maybe in that dead situation in your life, you've got to just stand on it in the spirit and say, Lord, I'm standing here and I'm giving thanks to you, Lord God. Lord, I'm standing, I'm positioning myself in the spirit over my marriage and I'm giving thanks to you, Lord God. It looks like it's dead on the outside, but Father, I'm giving you thanks that you called us and you say what, mad, what God has put toge together, let no man put his son. I'm standing on my marriage. Thank you, Lord God, that you're going before us, that you're making crooked places straight, that you're breaking in pieces gates of bronze that you're cutting bars of iron thank you lord god that you're making a way where there seems to be no way thank you father that you're a god of marriage that you're a god of relationship that you're the alpha and the omega you're the beginning and the end that you haven't brought me thus far to forsake me i thank you lord god i lift my eyes to him i thank you i th thank him thank him stand thank him and trust him to bring forth life amen it's a powerful powerful weapon thanksgiving 
remembrance, thanksgiving. So we've got to remember who God is and meditate on it. We've got to remember what God has done before and give thanks for this. And we've got to declare his praises. We've got to know who God is. We've got to remember who he is in order to, to praise him. Amen. Um, I think I want to do this, um, this example now. Can I call on you, Nwamisa? called Melissa. Okay. So I want to do this example and I'm going to use my husband. Um, yeah. So maybe you can come here, stand and face everyone. Now, if, if, if I, if I want, okay, so we come to praise God and we praise him in our, in our closet. Okay. How many of you say, okay, I'm going to praise God. And this is how you praise him. Lord, I praise you. Praise you, Lord. Praise you. Praise you, Lord. I praise you. I praise you. I lift your name on high. Lord, I praise you. I praise you. And I imagine I do this term. I praise you. I praise you. I praise you. I praise you. Praise you. How does that feel? <laughs> it's like, it's a bit weird. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> praise you. Praise you. Do, you. do you feel anything? No, it's like, I, I'm just like, okay, you praise me, but about what? Like, be specific, <laughs> you know? Okay, so some of us, that's, that's the lowest level of praise, people, okay? You really don't have to know someone to praise them like that. You really don't have to know God to praise them like that. Okay, then there's another level. Lumisa's going to enter into this level. He's, she's going to give an example. She's going to praise my husband. Just praise him however you want to praise him. <laughs> Okay, Pastor Paul, I praise you for being a good man. I praise you that you are a good man of God. I praise you for praying for over, over us. I praise you for leading us the way that God wants you to lead us. I praise you for speaking truth in our lives. I praise you for speaking the word of God in our lives. Okay, that's awesome. Thanks. Give her a hand. Yeah, that sounds Thanks. Good. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, that was nice. It was specific, and <laughs> it made me feel good. So she has, to, she has to have walked with him a bit to be able to do that. Amen. Could she have done that if she just met him in the street and she didn't know anything about him? No. Okay. So then, then, another, then there's another level of praise. Okay. <laughs> okay. If she had just met me in the street, she'll just say, I praise you for your fine looks. <laughs> <laughs> at, least, at, least, at least, you know, your past is secure in his in, in, in his, in his self-image and, and all of that, right? Okay. So, my love, I just want to thank you for, for leading our family so faithfully. And um, I see how you work. I don't know if there's anyone else who works as hard as you do. And you still keep your peace. You're still kind, um, even in the midst of your busy schedule. You're still faithful. Um, you're faithful to me, even though you see all those pretty girls out there dressed nicely in the corner. <laughs> you know, thanks. Thanks for always mentioning me, okay? <laughs> thanks for loving me. Um, thanks for disciplining the boys and being such a good role model to them. I really, I really appreciate that. I also really appreciate your integrity. I see it um, worked out week, week in, week out. There are things that come up and, and I notice it and I, and I love that about you. I also love how you speak um, tenderly to me. And um, yeah, okay. <laughs> How you speak to the treasure in me. Thanks for being patient with me. Um, and I could go on. So how did that make you feel? Now this one takes me to another level. <laughs> this one takes me somewhere else. <laughs> okay, thanks. You can give them a hand. You can clap for them. So, so why, why did I do that? Because Nemisa has walked with him to some degree, hasn't she? She knows him to some degree. So there's a level of praising that she can do. There's, there's a level of praising. I've walked with him for years and years and years. And he's my husband. He's my partner in life. He's my lover. He's my, uh, the, the father to my children. He's my best friend. He's my prayer partner. So there's a level of walking with him that I, that I have. And there's a level of knowing him that I have that no one else will know. And there's a level of praising that I can enter into with, in, into with him that none of you would be able to. Now, if we, if we just flip that over to God, I want to ask you, what level of relationship do you have with God? Where is your praise at? 
Is your praise limited to the praise songs that we sing in church? The words that aren't even your words. They're not even your revelation. Maybe you don't even have that revelation and you're singing it, which is great because we've come to corporate praise. But what are your words of praise to your God? How do you know him? How has he revealed himself to you? Do you know him? Do you walk with him enough? Because our level of praise depends on our level of relationship with the one that we walk with. Amen. And that is the type of praise that God is looking for. Now, there's a, there's a situation where David has escaped from Saul um, in 1 Samuel 21. David has escaped from Saul, and he's gone to King Ashish, who's the king with the Philistines. These are, the en- these are David's enemies, basically, and he's got so, it's got so bad with Saul that he's run to his enemies to try and find refuge there. And he gets there, and he, um, but the officers of King Ashish say, isn't this David who's going to be the king of the land? Isn't this the one that people honor but with dances and say, Saul has killed his thousands, but David is ten thousands. Then David hears all of these comments and David becomes very afraid. So David is very afraid of what the king of Gath is going to do to him. So what does he do? He pretends to be insane. And, and he allows spit to dribble down his beard. And it says that he scratches on doors and he drools. And he behaves like a madman because he's terrified. And he doesn't want anything to happen to him. And so the king says, why must you bring me this madman? Send him, send him away. I don't want him as a guest. And what does David do? This is, this is the psalm of David that he declares in this situation. He says, I will praise the Lord at all times. I will speak his praises and boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. What is, what is David saying? He's saying, I was helpless, but I took heart in the Lord and he delivered me. Let all who are helpless take heart. Let's tell of the Lord's greatness and exalt his name. I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. Personal revelation. I prayed, Lord, he, he was probably pl- praying really hard. God, you're going to have to save me from this king. I don't know what he's going to do to me. And then maybe God put it in his heart that he must behave like a madman. Okay. And he says, I prayed to the Lord and he answered me and he freed me from my fears. He was terrified of that king. How many of you could say, I prayed to the Lord. He answered me and he freed me from my fears. He deserves praise. This is what David is saying. Those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. In my desperation, I prayed and the Lord listened and saved me from my troubles. He's remembering. He's remembering what the Lord did. Okay, for the angel of the Lord is a God and surrounds and defends those who fear him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. He tasted and he saw. And he carries on, you can carry on reading in this particular psalm. Psalm 34, he says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues whose spirits are crushed. And he carries on and he carries on. It's powerful, powerful expression of a heart toward, of David towards a God, his God who rescued him from a terrifying situation. Psalm 145, this is what David says. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name. I will praise you. Great is the Lord. His greatness is unsearchable. I will declare your mighty acts and meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty. And he carries on, he says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all. He's saying these things. He has personal revelation of them. He has personal understanding of the compassions and mercies and grace of the Lord. He's declaring praise for attributes that he knows. He says his tender mercies are over all his works. Doesn't it blow your mind that David, being betrayed, falsely accused, rejected, chased all over the countryside, hunted like an animal, says his tender mercies are over all his works. Wow. His heart was so amazing towards God. And it carries on. You can go and read this psalm. He talks about the glorious majesty of God's kingdom, of the Lord's dominion. That that he that he says, and you raise up all who are bowed down. You give everyone their food in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. What is David doing? He's declaring his experience of God. He's declaring praise. To God, he said, the Lord is gracious in all his works, near to all who call upon him. His personal revelation is what he's experienced. 
My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh shall bless his name. I find it so many so interesting how many, so many attributes David mentions in this particular psalm. So fascinating. How many attributes could you mention in one praise song? Maybe you know three, and they're the same three that come up every year. <laughs> We've got to move on, people. We've got to move on. <laughs> We've got to grow up. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> okay. Praise is a weapon. Psalm 149, and I love this psalm. It says, let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth, a two-edged sword in their hand. Why? To execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on peoples. To bind kings with chains and nobles with fetters of iron. To execute on them the written judgment. This honor have Go Christian Church Band. I've got one person who's awake. <laughs> okay. This honor have only people who worship in the band. No. This honor have all his saints. Okay. It says, let them sing aloud on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth. Why? Because it's a, a, a weapon of warfare. The high praises in my mouth, a two-edged sword in my hand. This is what it does. Executing vengeance on the nations, punishments on peoples, binding kings with chains and nobles with fetters of iron. This honor have all his saints. But unfortunately, most of his saints are sitting on their beds sleeping. Unfortunately, most of us sit on our beds and we don't have the word of God in our, mouth, in our hands and we don't have the, the high praises of God in our mouths. We, 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 we silent. We silent and our hands hang down limp. But I want to say to us today, let's pick up the sword of the word of God. Let's put the two-edged two sword, uh, the, the high praises of God in our mouths. Let's use these weapons of war. They're spiritual weapons of war. Jehoshaphat, when he goes out against the enemies, what does he do? He puts the praises in the front, and when the people praise, the Lord sets ambushes against the enemies, and they win. Sometimes you've got to just stand still and begin to praise and begin to declare the word of God, and we'll see victory in our situations. Amen. Let's not close up and sit on our weapons that God has given us. So, I think I'm out of time. I am. David was a man of prayer. David was a man of praise. David was a man who inquired of the Lord and obeyed even when it cost him. David was a man after God's own heart. David was a man who God took from the wilderness, who God took from um, shepherding sheep and goats, who took from a place where he was a nobody. His own father didn't even recognize the greatness on his, on his life. And God took him from there and placed him on the throne. And God prepared him for that by many, many trials and tribulations but through it all David was a man of prayer a man of praise a man of thanksgiving he was a man of integrity a man who inquired of God and obeyed even when it cost him he was a man after God's heart and I'm wanting to encourage us this morning let's follow David's example amen amen I think I'm going to call up my husband to do the honors thanks very much my love I, I praise you I praise you I praise you <laughs> Father, thank you for your goodness and thank you for your presence. Thank you for this powerful word. Right now, we release your grace into this congregation, your grace for supplication, your grace for prayer. Thank you so much for the practical tools that we've received, Lord God. May we grow as a people. May you help us, Lord God. May you help us, Father, in our disciplines. May we put you first, Lord. May you show us the benefit of praise and the benefit of prayer. May you help us, Lord God, to break away from hurry sickness and to just come to a place of pausing in our lives so that we can tap into you, so that we can pursue you. Thank you for this word, Lord God. May it take root in our lives, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name. And the people of God said, Amen. How many of you feel equipped? I feel equipped. All right? I want to encourage you, come up with a plan for yourself right? There were a number of key points and just say to yourself, you know what? Tomorrow I'm going to start doing this. And you just pick one of them. And then the following day I'm going to do this. The following day I'm going to remember. Amen? And then it becomes a habit. Isn't that awesome? Thank you so much. <laughs>